It's good day to brew, baby. What is up, YouTube? It's your boy, Millsy. Back at the hometown, Commander. We're back for another episode of Millsy Brews, the show where I brew my version 1.0 deck list of the Commander in front of us on my quest out brew the magic world. And as always, the deck list will be down in the description for you below. Today, we're continuing pre-con week for murders at Karlov Manor. And uh, we're moving into Deep Clue C. I don't know if that's a fun, uh, uh, I don't know if that's a fun pun for you guys, but uh, we are looking at Morska underneath uh, Undersea Sleuth, uh, a deck that cares about investigating and clues. And I think it's just a really fun deck all around. If you've been looking for a deck that cares anything about artifacts, especially manipulating artifacts, and having fun with them, I think Morska gives us a really cool combination of uh, clue shenanigans and uh, potentially some Voltron aspects with her uh, slash them getting bigger and bigger. Morska Undersea Slew is a three mana two three Vidalcan Fish Detective. It says we have no maximum hand size. Beginning of our upkeep, we investigate, so we create a, two, a clue token. Uh, just remember that clue tokens at any time we can pay two mana and sacrifice it to draw a card. Um, a little reminder we're going to put in the back of our head for later in this episode is remember that you do not need to tap the clue in order to sacrifice it like you do with a treasure. So just keep that in the back of your mind when we when we get there. But this is whenever you draw your second card each turn, you put two counters, plus one, plus one counters on Morska. Now notice it says not each of our turns, each turn. So we're going to look to hopefully... Um, we're going to look to hopefully sacrifice clues on other people's turns as well to keep putting more and more counters... Um, on Morska, if that's the route we want to go. So whenever we draw our second card, Morska has an ability. So in order to go over kind of what, what our goal is for Morska and, and the clues, we need to talk about what we're going to try to do. So Morska's ability, of course, whenever you draw your second card each turn, whether it's by sacrificing a clue or doing other things, um, we put counters on, on them. So we have a couple other cards that care about the, when we draw our second card each turn or when we do certain things. So we, we've gonna, we're going to focus on that. Then we're going to focus on uh, how to get more clues or how to manipulate our clues for benefit. And that's where we're going to talk about some of the ways we can end the game. Uh, and also we're just going to talk about um, good value cards in the deck that really make you know these clues and this drawing and this investigating worth it in the, uh, in the long run. So to start with the drawing our second card each turn style of the deck. Let's kind of talk through a few of our cards that really care about drawing our second card. We have a Alondra Sky Dreamer that comes in the pre-count and we draw our second card each turn, we make a Drake. And if we can draw a fifth card, uh, it and Drake's we control get plus X plus X where X is the number of cards in our hand. This is a fun little way um, to potentially hit someone for a ton of damage if we can draw a bunch of cards, especially on our uh, turn, so that we can attack with them. Uh, but that 1-1, one, one, that 2-2 two, two Drake every turn of our turns, for sure, because we'll almost always be able to get you know a clue to sacrifice to draw a card on our turn, but if we can get in our opponent's turns as well, those 2-2s two will stack up. And Thurgill you know, Investigator says when we draw our second card each turn, we make a 1-1 one, one Spirit. Again, this is just a little incremental value we're going to get when we're drawing these cards. Same thing with Joel Riel from... M21, whenever we draw our second card, we get a cat, and for six mana, we can have creatures turn into XXs, where X is the number of cards in our hand, and that's a pretty cool finisher in itself, that we can go wide on the amount of creatures we have by these effects, and by other effects that we'll talk about in a second. Min Wily Illusionist is a card we brought in from our AF, uh, our, our uh, Adventure Forgotten Realms Commander decks, whenever we draw our second card each turn, we make an illusion, with this creature gets plus one, plus oh for each other illusion we control. That's pretty cool, because those illusions could get pretty big the more we do that. And then it says whenever an illusion we control dies, we can put a permanent with mana value less than equal to that creature's power from our hand on the battlefield. This could be a pretty fun way to cheat in some things if we have lots of illusions sticking around. And then we have the Council of Four. It says whenever a player draws their second card during their turn, you draw a card. This is uh, the Council of Four. And this is a great way to kind of placate ourselves, right? Get, um, get some extra card draw on our opponent's turns, make it a little bit easier to draw cards. And then the second ability gives us knights whenever they cast their second uh, spell each turn. So again, keeping into this, you know, use our effects to go wide um, and have a good time. So those are kind of the things that care about when we when we draw our second card each turn. There's a, there's a few other effects, but I think those are the big ones. And there's enough of them in the deck that we should hopefully see one um, in being able to use it uh, to our effect. Really quickly before we talk about the way we want to use the clues, um, 
I want to talk about some kind of alternate commanders in the deck. I always try my best when I build decks to put in commanders that if something happens to our main commander, we still have uh, creatures that can act as a as a you know as a as a backup commander, as a backup general, and allow our deck still to function. And one of those that does a really good job is Lonus Crypt Cryptozoologist. Um, getting a reprint in the deck whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under our control, we investigate. And we can sack X clues to have a target opponent reveal the top X cards of their library. And we can put a non-land permanent meta value X or less from them onto the battlefield and the rest go back on the bottom. This is a way if we have a ton of clues laying around and we can't possibly sacrifice them all or we are not drawing into any other effects to use them. Otherwise, Lonus can just turn them into value in hurting our opponents. We have the new Lonus from the uh, Clue uh, release, the, the Ravnica Clue edition release. It says whenever one or more counters are put on Lonus, we investigate that many times. And whenever we sacrifice a Clue, we put a plus and plus one counter on another target creature we control. Well, uh, you might ask yourself, how do we get plus and plus one counters on Lonus? Well, Lonus has evolved, so as a bigger creature comes in, it'll get plus and plus one counters on it. We're actually playing a couple other cards that will spread plus and plus one counters around to other creatures. Playing Rosy Cotton, anytime we make a token, you put a counter on a creature that isn't rosy. Well, as we're investigating, we're making clue tokens, so this is going to spread plus and plus one counters around. And we're also playing Yoshin Dissident uh, from the Brothers War. Whenever an artifact comes in under our control, we put a counter on target creature to control. This is going to spread plus and plus one counters around to all of our creatures, but could be put on Lonus bonus as well um, to continue to um, make uh, make clues. Now, the fun part about Lonus and Yoshin Dissident is that they actually are a really fun combo. And if you think about it, as long as we get a clue into play, Yoshin Dissident puts a, a counter on Lonus. Lonus sees that counter put on it and investigates again. And we can choose to do this as many times as we want to. And again, as long as we have another creature... Um, oh, actually, we don't need another creature because the ocean could just put the counter on itself. Um, we could just arbitrarily make a ton of clues, and with some of these ways we're going to talk about ending the game, this could potentially make an unstoppable board state for our opponents to deal with, making 100, 200, 500 clues that we could then use of, for our, our game ender effects we'll talk about in a second, and just shut our opponents out of the game. Okay, so that's just a little bit of fun. I wanted to talk about that combo because it's a pretty cool combo. Um, we can actually do it the same way with Rosie Cotton as well, now that I realize it, because it says whenever we make a token. So as long as we're investigating by putting a counter on something, uh, Rosie Cotton will do it as well. But that's neither here nor there. Let's talk about um, how we're going to make more clues. We have lots of cards in the deck that care about investigating, and I'm not going to go through all of them because there's a lot of really fun new cards that do that. But what I do want to talk about is the way we can potentially get more clue tokens. We have Adrix and Neb that got a reprint in the precon, talking about doubling the amount of tokens we would make, which is pretty darn cool. And in the in the um, enchantment slot, I really thought about playing Parallel Lives or Anointed Procession, uh, but I decided not to, not because they're not good cards, but I wanted to try out Mondrak. I, I love Mondrak. It's a creature I really enjoy, and it's about the same cost as the other two anyway. Uh, Parallel Lives, I think, is a little bit cheaper because of its reprint, but either way, Mondra can protect itself and make it indestructible. And again, we don't need a ton of doublers. I think we're going to do a really good job making them uh, otherwise. We also have Ex Essex Fractal Bloom, the alternate commander to Ajax, and I've actually got a reprint here as well. And this one's kind of fun. The first time we would create one or more tokens during each of our turns, we can instead choose a creature other than Essex and make tokens that are copies of that creature. This is a really fun effect that as long as we're picking something that isn't legendary, we could probably take really good advantage of. Um, my thought would be something like Kappa Cannoneer, a creature that whenever an artifact comes in, we put a counter on it and it can't be blocked this turn. Um, we could just have fun having three or four Kappa Cannoneers that can start hurting our opponents. Of course, there's other great non-legendary creatures in the deck, but that's just one of the fun ones. Now, um, pushing into how we're going to try to use our clues for advantage in the game, I added two creatures into the deck which are both going to allow our, cl our clues or our tokens in general to tap for mana. Jihiro lets all of our tokens tap for a green, and Urza will let any untapped artifact... Um, tap with its ability for blue. I know saying Urza is going to push a lot of people away, but Urza is really going to help our deck in a lot of ways. It's not our commander, and that will help it not get as, this deck not get as much hate. But again, at the end of the day, if we can turn our clues into mana, we're going to, we're going to definitely push the game forward. Our deck has three cards that hopefully are going to help us take our clues and end the game. The first is Cyber Drive Awakener. When it comes in, we turn all non-creature artifacts we control into Artifact creatures with power and toughness 4-4, four, four. Um, and all of our other artifact creatures have flying. This turns all of our clues into 4-4 four, four flyers and should help us definitely push through to end the game. Rise and Shine 
Turn all of our non-creature artifacts for six mana into zero zero creatures that put um, that we put four plus and plus one counters on, and then we can take a big attack with them. Again, as long as the clues didn't come in this turn, we can attack with them and have fun. And then the new card, Tangle Crow of Kelp, being a combat, each other clue we control becomes a six six plant creature in addition to their other types until end of turn. And so uh, this would be fun with Rise and Shine because then they could become ten tens. Whereas uh, with Cyber Drive, they'll still become six sixes with the Kelp. But either way, the Kelp's pretty cool because it is going to uh, turn all of our clues into six sixes and potentially help us start beating down our opponents. So those are the main ways we're probably going to go ahead and just probably straight up end a game outright, turn all of our clues into creatures and take a big attack. Um, but as you can see, we have these other ways to kind of manipulate the deck and have some fun. We also have things like Nettle Cyst, which, and, uh, which was already in the precon, but I added two more cards like it, and this is another way to help us in the game with things like Nettle Cyst, Michiko's Reign of Truth, or All That Glitters, which are going to buff a creature for, the, for each artifact or enchantment we control. We could put this on a flyer, on our commander, or on something else to give them a giant buff for, buff for all these cl uh, clues and other things we have, and have them hit into our opponent for damage. And Nettle Cyst and All That Glitters are just going to go on one creature, Whereas Michiko's does it on the first two of its saga and then turns over into a creature that gets pulse on pulse one for each artifact we control, which can make it a threat in its own right. I love Michiko's because it's not a very expensive card and it lets us have some fun. We also have mechanized production. Of course, we put it uh, put it on a clue and then at the start of our upkeep, we make a, a, a token that's copy of it. As long as we have eight clues, we win the game. It's not going to be very hard to do and it's just going to act as another way for us to finish out the game and uh, get it moving. But let's go over to our play test. I think I've done a pretty good job of explaining what we're trying to do with the deck. Get clues, use the clues for value, worst case scenario, turn them all to creatures and win the game. We start with the two lander, which isn't bad with something like Growth Spiral, which I have to admit, I wonder why it isn't in the deck. It draws us a card and we can put a land in the battlefield, but that's neither here nor there. Peregrine Toke's a fun card, makes, makes food every time we make another token and we can sack three foods to draw a card. It just feels good if we can make a ton of way to make clues, we can be able to make those foods as well. And I think this pairs really well with things like Academy Manufacturer in the deck, which anytime we would make a clue, we make a clue, a food, and a treasure. So the foods are going to be there for us to sacrifice. Organic okay, Extinction, great board wipe. It's going to destroy all non-artifact creatures. Eidolon of Oblivion draws us a card if we made a token this turn. And then Sword to Plowshares for some removal. Turn one, we've drawn Council of Four, a card we talked about. We want to get down and we can have some fun with it. We'll put that Scatter Groves in tapped and uh, take advantage of it. Turn two here with the Flooded Grove to play that Gross Bile. Turn two, we draw Farmland, which is great. And I would just use these two right now to play Gross Bile. We can either do it on our turn or our opponent's turn. It doesn't really matter. Either way, we use it. We draw a Wooded Bastion, which is great. And we would get that... Um, we would get that, uh, put that farmland down. Now, the reason we can do this on somebody else's turn is it doesn't say um, you may play a land, it just says put a land from your hand on the battlefield, so we can do it on somebody else's turn. Now this means as soon as we untap, we can play more scuff, that's what we want to do. Seaside Citadel, great card. Uh, I would probably throw that in taps and it's got to come in dapped and just get more scuff down. Now we have no hand size. The game of our turn, we're going to make a clue and we have a chance next turn to start getting counters on the more scuff. This turn, we're going to make a... Um, we're going to make a clue. So we have one. We drew one of our other filter lands there, which is pretty great. Um, I could see I don't want Oblivion making sense here because we have made a token this turn, so we could draw right away, uh, and that would be pretty good because it would activate Morsco right away. So I'd say let's get that Bastion down. Probably Peregrine Took and the Eidolon Oblivion here. Tap it to draw cards since we made a clue this turn. Morska goes off and gives us some counters. Now they're up to a 4-5, and uh, we're in good shape. No other ways to make tokens yet, but that's okay because next turn we're going to make a clue and a food to get Peregrine uh, Took going. I think I... Uh, that's right, I drew for turn. Uh, this turn we see Mean and Den, which is great. Now we can start taking advantage of sacrificing those clues to draw cards. Um or even using this Eidolon Oblivion to draw cards and get those illusions. So this turn, we can go ahead and throw it on that Deeper Cascade, six mana. I like getting Mina down, and I guess we can just leave, um, we can just leave that Swords of the Plowshares up to protect, uh, to uh, remove something. Uh, we made both a clue and a food this turn, so we're gonna tap the Eidolon Oblivion to draw a card. The cool part here is because we, um, Drew a card, that's our second card, so Mina's going to make an illusion, and Peregrine Took is going to make a food. So now we're up to three foods, so we could draw with Peregrine if we wanted to, but I think we wait. Uh, just three mana left, so I think we just, like I said, hold up this 
Swords to Plowshares, uh, Morsk is now up to a 6-7, so could take an attack here if we want to, otherwise we wait this next turn. We're up to 7 mana, and Hydroid Crasis, which is a great card, can come down, draw us half of X, and, ha and gain half of X life, and it comes in with Flying and Trample. It's a pretty cool creature, and it can get pretty big. We got that clue and that food at the start of the turn. I think I play Mondrak down before I tap this Eidolon Oblivion. That way we get two Illusions and... Uh, two food, if I recall correctly, with the way Mondrax replacement effect works. I could be wrong on that. It could just be two illusions and a food. Either way, um, we tap this, draw a card, get the illusions, get the food. We've got uh, three mana left. Rosie's a great card for that. Going to start putting counters on things, so I like that. I would get her down. She comes in, gives us another food, becomes two with Mondrak. Um, becomes three with uh, Peregrine Choke. We can now draw a couple cards with Peregrine Choke. But what I like about this current scenario here is, and that would put a few plus one plus one counters on with Rosie, but hopefully we have enough foods where we can start drawing cards on our opponent's turns with these foods and start giving these effects going off on our opponent's turns, amassing us more value as we go. We could do the same thing with Council of Four had we put it down. But that's why I was uh, targeting a card like Peregrine Took is, because as soon as this, we have enough foods, um, it, as long as we can do it on someone else's turn but ours, maybe not everybody's turn, but at least one of our opponent's turns and ours, we're going to be growing Morska to the point that it's going to become a threat. And we're also just going to be going wide here at this point. We're getting all these illusions that at this point are probably six ones, seven ones, right, with how many we've made so far. Maybe they're a little bit less than that. But still, the more we make, the worse they're going to get to deal with. And Rosie's going to start throwing out plus and plus one counters. Maybe we don't put all of them on... Morska, maybe we throw them on Mondrak or Mina herself and start, I mean, start trying to give all the threats to ourselves and just our commander. Yes, our commander is going to start hurting people and they're going to have to figure out what the heck they're going to do with our commander as it grows and grows. And Morska will eventually become a lightning rod for removal. That's where we're going to replay them. But I like him at this point because now we have this engine set up that um, we really don't even need... Um, Morska at this point. We just need to find a way to make a token somehow, which won't be very hard, or draw an extra card, right, with Mean, and now we're good to go. We made the tokens, we made the foods, we can draw cards with Peregrine Took, and now our commander, you know, will, will help us here is if someone nukes our commander out of the battlefield, we still have a strategy, and we still have it moving. Uh, I'm really excited. Morska is the precon that I chose to get uh, from this time around, um, because... Uh, I have been trying out Urza, the Esper Urza, with uh, the constructs and that. It's a deck I really enjoy, but it's in the Esper space, and I already have a Layla, and I've been kind of unsure about how much I'll be willing to play that deck. But what I like about moving into Bant here is I can take some of the cards from that deck and move them over here. So I get to play that artifact fun without it being in the same colors as a Layla, and get to play a couple cards that I've never had the privilege of playing before, and something like Kappa Cannony or Adrix and Nev and Essex are pretty fun cards. So let me know, what do you think of Morska Clues down in the comment section below? I'd love to hear what you guys think as as uh, you've seen already this week my 10 card upgrade is going to be going up right now uh, today as well for just the 10 cards that i would upgrade the pre-con with i hope you guys enjoy that content it's been fun for me to make and i will catch you guys next time